And this meeting is being recorded. That's good to know. Slideshow from the beginning. So once again, my name is Dave Kattenberg and I'm a member of this, a wonderful group called Scientists for Palestine. Um, many years ago, I was a member of a group called Science, Science for the People, uh, which had a special project um, called Science, uh, Science for Nicaragua. Uh, that, that's another story. I think somehow organically, um, Science for Palestine kind of came out of that. I'm just doing this. Okay, here we go. So Scientists for Palestine uh, was created by a collective of theoretical physicists in 2015. So we've been around for coming on six years, over a hundred members worldwide. And our mission is to promote science and support integration of occupied Palestinian territories into the international scientific community, pr promote interactions. And we've got a, a host of different activities that we engage in. We hold international meetings. The most recent was uh, <clears throat> an annual general meeting at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in January of 2020. And uh, we try to organize uh, sessions, live sessions each year. Um, one of Scientists for Palestine's most exciting activities is an advanced physics school. Many of the founding members of Scientists for Palestine were uh, from the physics community, from the exact sciences and physics community, theoretical physics. So historically, this is the way it's been. Uh, we're now kind of branching outwards, but just by way of saying that um, Scientists for Palestine organizes an advanced physics school. There were schools held uh, at Birt Seit University and Arab American University in 2016 and 17. And we're now in the process of organizing a, a school, uh, hopefully sometime this summer um, in, uh, in Palestine in the West Bank uh, on uh, machine learning, which we're all very excited about. We're branching out into medicine engineering and data science. Uh, hopefully at some point in the future, we'll organize a, a school in Gaza. Um, we, um, uh, amongst our activities is, is advocacy. Uh, we advocate for, for Palestinians who are facing difficulties and our, our most um, recent uh, efforts have been on behalf of a gentleman named Dr. Imad Barghouti, who's a professor of astrophysics at Al Quds University. Al Quds, of course, means Jerusalem. Al Quds University is in Abu Dis in the West Bank. It's really a 20 minute drive from, from Jerusalem. And Imad Barghouti is an astrophysicist who was arrested uh, by uh, occupation authorities in July of last year, indicted for his uh, social media activity uh, on August 2nd. And he's been held since then in uh, administrative detention. Um, he missed his daughter's wedding on Christmas day and the chance to see his first grandson. On January 9th, military court rejected his appeal, um, the appeal of his extension of administrative detention. The way it works in Israel, they, they arrest you without charge um, uh, administratively and they can renew that every six months which is what they tend to do for no reason without charge. And so his administrative detention was extended until mid-February. Uh, the Barghouti family is now appealing to the Israeli Supreme Court. Uh, we have uh, put out an appeal to the international community and, and we'll do so again uh, in the lead up to, to Dr. Barghouti's appeal to the Supreme Court, hoping to get a letter in Hebrew published in Haaretz uh, we've got a, a, a host of, of long-term goals, of course, maintaining our, our webinar series, uh, organizing mentorship and exchange programs, scholarship programs, business innovation, entrepreneurship programs, and, and hopefully more work uh, in the area of promoting health sciences. So 
uh, you, you can follow us on, on social media and you can send us an email. And if you're a, a scientist uh, who's uh, sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, you can even join. Um, today, a very exciting webinar, Renewable Energy in the Occupied Palestinian Territories, Advances and Challenges. And in a moment, I'll pass this over to Rania, who will uh, introduce the speakers. Um, but uh, just to close, I, I want to share this with you. This is exceptionally timely. Um, uh, renewable energy uh, is uh, an energy provision is a matter of life and death in Palestine. And on, uh, on New Year's Day, a gentleman named um, Harun, uh, Harun Abu Aram, was a 24-year-old guy in Kirbet al-Rakiz, was uh, shot uh, by Israeli occupation forces while, of course, defending a generator. Uh, the Israelis were in the process of demolishing this village. Um, and uh, in the course of this, this they, they seized a generator. Here is the generator. And there was a tug of war. I don't know if this was posted on Facebook and you, you could see this um, going on. And this, this chap um, uh, got involved in a tug of war. Um, here's the quote, we immediately started trying to pull the generator back towards us. We needed to power our lights, refrigerators and appliances and heaters during the winter. This is a quote from, uh, from uh, ha Harun Abu Aram's father. Um, this gentleman, young man is now in a Hebron hospital and he's paralyzed having been shot uh, in the course of trying to stop the forces from seizing his generator. So um, th this is uh, this is a uh, a struggle in Palestine um, and uh, a, ma a matter of life and death. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass this over the microphone over to Rania, who will introduce the speakers, and um, I, I suspect the, the speakers will have the chance to kind of talk about the the sort of challenge that's embodied in what I've just shown you, like getting shot in the course of trying to protect your little diesel generator. Rania, take it away. Thank you, David. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming and for investing your time with us today. As David mentioned, my name is Rania and I am moderate, moderating this event. I'm an analyst focused on sustainable development and, and implementations of solutions. It truly embodies the triple bottom line of people, planet, and economics. Today, we have an amazing panel of experts that will discuss renewable energy in Palestine. As David mentioned, Palestinian territories face significant energy security challenges due to a myriad of factors, including lack of natural resources, unstable political conditions, financial crisis, and a highly density uh, population. Moreover, Palestinians depend on other countries for 100% of their fossil fuels imports and 87% of its electricity imports. The total energy com consumption per habitat in Palestine is the lowest in the region and costs more than anywhere else in the Middle East. Energy is becoming more and more unaffordable because of the rapid po poverty and widespread unemployment. And energy, as we all know, is continuous driving force uh, for economic and sustainable development, social improvements, and improved quality of life. So the demand for electricity outpaces the current supply and demand and will only continue to grow. And energy shortages will continue to increase unless there's a new supply of options that are found. So renewable energy has the potential to meet those demands, diversify the country's energy profile, decrease energy dependence from neighboring countries, sustainable development, overall contribute to better quality of life. So before we get to our panelists, I want to give a quick overview of this event. So each panelist will have around 10 minutes, which will then be followed by a question and answer session. And then for our first panelist, we have uh, Tamar Khatib, who is, an, who is an associate professor of renewable energy and chairman of natural sciences at Al Najah University. His research primarily focuses on photo PV systems and solar radiation. He holds habitation, which is the highest academic degree in German speaking countries in renewable and sustainable energy. Tamir also serves as the chair of the professional association I, 
um, EEE, which is the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, the Palestine subsec subsection, and he's the director of a Najah company for consultancy technical studies. Go ahead, Tamer. Thank you so much, Rania. Um, welcome, everybody. I would like us to share my slides. So um, in this evening, we're going to talk about uh, um, Palestine electricity and renewable energy uh, policy model. Like what, what is the, the, the basis that such a policy model is uh, being involved and uh, the history of uh, the energy in, in Palestine, as well as the challenges that uh, uh, such a policy model is facing. And from an academic uh, point of view, what, what kind of, uh, uh, what should be next? Like what kind of a future sustainable energy policy model should be so as to have uh, uh, sustainable energy sources uh, at Palestine. So um, um, to start with, I would like just to make an overview about the history of, uh, uh, of electricity generation in Palestine. Uh, and in the past, like before 1940, uh, uh, 1948, uh, um, um, uh, but has Rutenberg, who is an Ukrainian uh, engineer, uh, just has proposed uh, um, an, a powerhouse genera a power generating house to the British mandate so as to electrify some of the cities in Palestine, as Ronin Shamir has stated in his uh, outstanding book, Electrification of Palestine. Uh, when Ben has has uh, proposed his uh, 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 proposal to the British mandate, uh, uh, the proposal was based on generating electricity using hydraulic power station using a small river called the Laoja River, um, uh, which is currently near Tel Aviv. It's a small river, it's a stream actually, it's not a river. Although the, the, the proposal uh, wasn't really sound technically because the river is really a, a very small river and does not have um, uh, that potential to generate electricity to electrify uh, uh, cities, huge cities such as Tel Aviv and Java at that time, but the British mandate has agreed this proposal or approved this proposal. And uh, there were some interesting conditions uh, to uh, approve this proposal that uh, electricity should be used to unify Jews and, uh, Jews and Arab together. And there should not be any discrimination between both uh, races uh, uh, in order to have kind of a, a stable uh, a service to both sides. Um, um, when Ben has Rittenberg has started uh, doing his project, um, uh, he did not apply what he proposed, like he did not use hydraulic power stations because as I said, it's, it, it does not technically sound, but he used uh, uh, diesel generators instead of that. And he even did not use any British technique. He used uh, 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 German machines uh, from Siemens company. Um, when he started uh, uh, generating electric electricity, he realized that generating electric electricity is not the, the only goal while uh, distributing electricity and transmitting electricity to the both cities, which is, which are Java and Tel Aviv, uh, uh, was the main idea. So uh, uh, the problem here starts uh, uh, started to appear, which which is um, 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 that the collaboration between uh, uh, Ben Hazrat and the powerhouse and these two cities. Um, uh, from Tel Aviv side, uh, uh, the mayor of Tel Aviv, who was busy at that time was really happy to have such an option. And he said, well, let's have this electricity. And he offered a lot of facilitation in association with the British mandate so as to buy lands from Arab uh, landlords so as to put the pools of electricity and to generate electricity and to get uh, electric, electricity to Tel Aviv. The, the main aim of the, the idea of this over at that time that electricity will provide more sustainable uh, life to the, the city will make the city more developed and will create more jobs where the immigrants, the Jews immigrants who are coming from Europe at that time, they can find some jobs because it's not just from, as, as usually we know, like promising the people that, well, uh, uh, this is the homeland. No, it's just sometimes you have to create jobs to, to attract people to come to the land. So at that time, because of the electricity, the, um, um, uh, the farming process become more developed, uh, more jobs were created and Tel Aviv become a very um, developed city. On the other hand, um, um, from Java side, the, the mayor of Java or the, the committee that controlling Java, they thought that Ben Hazrat and Bible is a Jew and this electricity coming from the Jew and we have to boycott uh, this electricity. And uh, uh, a huge conflict occurred at that time between Ben Hazrat and Ben Powerhouse and uh, Java uh, municipality so as not to, to get the electricity because for Rottenberg, he, he wants Java to get electricity so as to satisfy the British mandate. 
um, um, so as to show them that, well, I'm, I'm providing electricity to the Jew and the Arab at the same time, but uh, Java uh, uh, municipality uh, uh, did not agree to get electricity from that. And here, the, the, the main problem that Java municipality at that time did not propose any alternative uh, solution to have electricity. And uh, eventually we get what we say that two uh, uh, cities, one is really developed with electricity and uh, a lot of uh, the privilege of electricity, including the jobs, the security, uh, uh, all of the facility of life that, that electricity enhanced such facilities while Java was really staying in dark uh, conditions. And the British mandate at that time did not make any action so as to um, 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 uh, address this uh, 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 issue. So the conflict was that, well, the, the hazard in the Jew and the electricity is coming from uh, Jew. Following that, uh, uh, some of the, 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 the municipalities all over Palestine, they started to do some local efforts by buying some diesel generators, but the efforts was, were really limited and uh, 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 the people of Palestine did not really make uh, uh, real uh, initiatives to get electricity at that time because um, for them, it's, well, it's really good, but it's something new for them. And uh, they did not really realize how important it is to get electricity so as to enhance, as I said, farming, uh, security, uh, everything. You know, electricity can mix everything, uh, can make everything better. So um, um, following that, the, after 1948, uh, Jordan uh, uh, has the West Bank and uh, Gaza was following Egypt. So Jordan was trying to uh, supply electricity to, to, to some regions uh, through what we call uh, uh, JITCO, which is the, Jor the Jerusalem uh, uh, Distribution Electricity Company. Um, um, but the electricity was really limited and mainly was provided to Jerusalem and some near nearby uh, cities, like uh, near nearby cities or locations even. So uh, um, at that time, the local efforts was still uh, 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 ongoing. However, these local efforts wasn't really uh, weren't really uh, uh, good enough to to uh, electrify uh, the Palestinian uh, um, uh, cities. On the other hand, most of the Jewish uh, 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 cities was really well electrified by the Hazard and project and another projects, and even later other uh, important projects. So, uh, um, following that, uh, um, um, some in 1967 and after uh, uh, war 1967 and even after 1987, Jordan has uh, decided to abandon the West Bank and uh, the Israeli uh, uh, government has put control to the West Bank and has connected the West Bank mainly through a 161 kilovolt connection, which is a line that connects most of the West Bank um, by, by electricity. But this line was controlled by the Israeli government by minimum electricity, so as just to have minimum requirements of electricity. Because electricity, as you know, means that development, industry, uh, better farming conditions, and the Israeli government at that time wanted madly to control these activities in, these, in this uh, location so as to uh, uh, maintain the, 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 the superiority of uh, uh, the Israeli industry, everything. Um, so uh, uh, West Bank up to 1987 was really staying in dark. And uh, it, it, it's not surprising that some villages in Palestine or in the West Bank uh, got electrified by even after 1996, uh, uh, okay? Uh, at that time, JETCO remains uh, working in, in West Bank, but after, uh, like, uh, under a name called uh, uh, Jericho Electricity Distribution Company, and uh, JETCO continues uh, um, um, electrifying some zones in, in the West Bank. Uh, in the meanwhile, some other uh, entities followed by the municipalities, uh, like Nablus Municipality, uh, uh, Ramallah Municipality, uh, Janin Municipality, started to coordinate the electricity uh, uh, first by doing diesel generation, uh, electricity distribution, then by uh, maintaining the relation between the IEC, which is the Israeli electricity company, and uh, the customers or the end users. Uh, so all of this process was, was controlled or even managed uh, by the Palestinian municipalities uh, in, 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 in the West Bank. Here, the, uh, we have to differentiate between the Israeli electricity company and uh, um, the, 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 the municipal, like the, the Israeli government, because for Israeli electricity company, it's a, gov it's a, it's a company and uh, they are interested in distributing more electricity because it means more money for them. It means for more customers for them. It means more development for them.
system, but for the Israeli government, uh, uh, it means that more electricity, more industry, more uh, uh, opportunities, more farming opportunities, more uh, job creation, and this should be controlled because uh, um, I'm sure you know that there are about 300,000 uh, Palestinian laborers who are working inside Israel. Uh, now, in, in case that West Bank got enough electricity to, to build industry, to build uh, uh, um, a good farming, this means that most of these laborers will go back to the West Bank and work in the West Bank and create more economic or better economic or at least competing economic to the Israeli economy. And that's why uh, all, all of the electricity is controlled currently, even up to now, is controlled by what we call the uh, current caps, which, which means that uh, they allow, for example, for a huge city like Nablus, some specific amount of electricity. And this is controlled by what we call it uh, the, the, the administration of the Australian administration office, which is followed, which is uh, um, uh, and, and, uh, like a body that is affiliated with the Israeli government. And uh, up to Oslo Accords, uh, uh, um, when uh, like uh, um, Oslo happened uh, um, uh, from, si from the side of the Palestinians, it was very surprising that uh, the Palestinians just decided to sign the, the accords. While for the, the Israeli government, they, the government just wanted to, uh, to win some time. And uh, for the Palestinians, they did not give that much attention to the uh, electricity and water distribution at that time because the Palestinian uh, uh, Authority, or the PLO, okay, at that time, they just wanted to have uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, situation, okay? And they believed that this is just a principle declaration and later on we can do everything in a better way. So in Oslo Accord, there were two statements about electricity and energy, very simple statements that electricity should be uh, uh, generated or distributed in the West Bank in collaboration with the Israeli uh, um, um, government. Excuse me. And, yes. Uh, Tamer, uh, two yes. questions. Uh, unfortunately, we have such a short time. So if you could please try to wrap up um, your presentation. And also, can you please put it in full screen? A lot of the audience can't see yeah. the detail. Okay, sure. sure. Thank you. Um, um, so I said electricity should be in collaboration or electricity should be in collaboration with, uh, or, sorry, electricity distribution should be in collaboration with Israel and energy generation in general, not just electricity, any energy uh, investment or activity should be in collaboration with the Israeli government. So Israel maintained the control of electricity and energy at that time in, in the West Bank. And the PA or the PLO did not give that attention because they believe that Oslo is just a principal declaration and later on we can uh, uh, put everything in a better situation with the Israeli government. Nothing happened, as you know, and uh, later we had some distribution distribu distribution uh, uh, companies like what I'm showing on the map, uh, like every city uh, has its own distribution company, and these are private entities, not following any uh, uh, governmental uh, control. And they are all uh, uh, collaborating with Israel or the IEC, the Israeli Electricity Company, and they just maintain things together without relating to the Palestinian government. Uh, just to make the presentation short, this is the current uh, energy framework in, in Palestine, where, uh, as you see, JETCO, NETCO, TEDCO, all of these distribution companies are connected to the Israeli, to Isra the Israeli company or the Israeli electricity company, which is connected to the Israeli government. At the same time, they are connected to the PA, which is the Palestinian Authority, through some, some specific body. And this mess uh, should be uh, um, really maintained. And that's why the Palestinian uh, Authority would like to uh, uh, have more control on these distribution companies, so as to control the, the, the PEL, the electricity PEL, between the Israeli electricity company and uh, um, um, the end users. So they have established what we call Palestine Electricity Transmission Line, a company. Uh, the aim of this company is to control the transmission lines um, uh, between the Israeli electricity company and the distribution, com the distribution companies, the Palestinian distribution companies, which is which, which just not not just the cities, the huge cities, even if every village council has its own ability to distribute electricity in collaboration with the Israeli electricity company. So it's just, just a mess, like it's a Palestinian authority that is related to the Palestinian government, but at the same time, it's, the Palestinian government cannot control this entity because this entity is directly connected to the Israeli electricity company. Um, so it's, it's, it's really a mess. And this is the desired energy framework that Bendra, or like uh, the Palestinian authority would like to have, uh, uh, um, uh, although all of, of the stakeholders uh, of energy in Palestine, like Jordan, uh, Egypt, uh, the Israeli company are in the framework. 
Now, uh, uh, there was, when renewable energy uh, uh, technology was uh, on the table, the Palestinians thought that, well, this is the dream. We can get renewable energy because the conventional electricity is coming from Israel and there is no way to get independent without uh, independent energy sources. And that's why uh, uh, renewable energy was the dream for the Palestinian Authority, so as to generate electricity from photovoltaics or wind turbines internally in A zones, which is uh, directly related to the Palestinian Authority, so as to uh, get kind of independence uh, of electricity. However, there were a lot of missing technical information where the Palestinians thought that, well, uh, 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 we can generate electricity, although you cannot generate electricity without being synchronized with the, elect with the electricity network, which is processed by the uh, electricity Israeli company. And uh, 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 this was uh, the, the most uh, important technical missing issue that, well, we would like to generate more electricity by renewable energy, but we have to connect to the, the grid, which is processed by the Israeli electricity company. And now, because of, of, of such a, a, a mess, there were a lot of play, pool players in, 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 the, in the technology where we have a lot of failures in many systems of renewable energy. I'm showing such some, some, some uh, uh, research results. I'm sorry, I'm going very fast so as to stick to the time. Uh, I'm, I'm showing some failures here uh, in, in, in some systems installed in Palestine. And uh, there were a lot of failures and a lot of conflicts with the Israeli electricity company. I'm showing here the, the electricity network of two bus. Uh, um, uh, the red uh, uh, spots means that we do have a critical electricity situation. So two bus government, the government, governorate or city is facing a lot of critical situation because a lot of distributed generation of photovoltaics are on, installed in the grid without proper planning because there were a lot of missing technical information from the side of the Palestinian Authority, and there were not really enough training so as to maintain such a technology. In the meanwhile, there were not a lot of uh, collaboration from the Israeli electricity company. And what is really, really funny now, that the Israeli electricity company is facing a lot of problems because of these activities. If we look at the blue uh, uh, dots in the network, this is the connection with the Israeli electricity company. And blue means that a lot of problems here, all, all the, there are, are appearing because of uh, deviation in the frequency, in, in, in the underloading of the uh, the coupling point, a lot of technical issues. I'm not going to so much in the technical issues, but now we are facing a lot of problems with the Israeli electricity company, where, where they are giving some alerts to the Palestinian distribution companies that we have you have to to turn off all of your renewable energy uh, systems inside the grid because they are harming our network. Otherwise, we will cut uh, the electricity uh, from. Uh, the networks and uh, um, uh, currently there are a lot of uh, renewable energy systems that are uh, um, facing a lot of problems uh, specifically in A zones in, in, in all of the Palestinian uh, cities. So uh, what should be next? Actually, first of all, we have a lot of failures in, in, in Palestine and the Palestinian, uh, and Palestinian government that should be uh, our first um, um, like addressed. The first period is the, the lack of technical information at the Palestinian side. There should be there should be a lot of training so as to get more trained and expert people in that. Uh, we have to uh, uh, reform the Palestinian renewable energy in collaboration with the Israelis. They have to 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 take responsibility of uh, being connected or being connecting a lot of Palestinian people so as to make what we call a dynamic network so as not so as to be able to install renewable energy systems without having technical problems. And the most important thing that we have to unbundle the transmission lines. You know, the transmission lines are passing all of all over the West Bank. And these transmission lines, unfortunately, are powering Palestinian city cities and settlements. And for the Palestinian electricity transmission line company, it's impossible to, to manage any of these transmission lines because such a Palestinian company cannot manage a line that is providing Palestinian cities and settlements at the same time, okay? Because uh, technically, it, it will not happen, okay? So our proposal at some specific points was is to uh, um, uh, handle these lines to a private company, to a private company, although it's not recommended technically, but the only way is to put these transmission lines under private companies, international private companies, so as to manage, uh, I'm talking about the 161 kilovolt uh, transmission line, so as to manage the process of developing renewable energy in Palestine. Otherwise, the development of renewable energy in Palestine would really be impossible, and we will be facing a lot of technical information, technical problems in connecting these uh, uh, um, systems. And the problem is that Palestinian uh, uh, company 
uh, the authority, Palestinian authority has issued a lot of license to uh, generate electricity using renewable energy. Meanwhile, the grid infrastructure is not really able to uh, accept all of these energy because of the, the, the political situation. In order just to summarize my idea that electricity uh, um, um, uh, quality in Palestine is really bad and uh, the people are suffering from a lot of uh, issues because of electricity. I'm just sharing two uh, interesting maps. The first map is showing uh, the energy poverty uh, uh, concentration in the world and we can see that there are a lot of energy poverty in Africa and India and, and some energy poverty in, in the Middle East. In the, in the meanwhile, the other map showed the conflicts in, in the world and we can see a very, very clear association with the energy poverty and the conflicts in these zones, which means that energy means equality and equality means peace. Otherwise, there will not be peace because uh, uh, people would like to get the rights first, then, it, then they can think about peace later on. I'm so sorry. Thank for you so much, Tamar. It's so okay. Much. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really sorry. We really have to um, get no, the no presentation problem. moving thank forward. You. But thank you so much for providing us for providing us with that amazing background and showing, giving us a better insight on the history of electricity in Palestine. And for anyone asking, we will be posting the PowerPoints on the S4P website. Now for our next panel, our next panelist is Maj Mashal. Masharawi, sorry if I mispronounced it. She's a right. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, she's a resident of Gaza and founder of Green Cake, which is a company that creates environmentally friendly um, bricks and bricks from ash and rubble. She also developed Sunbox in 2017, which is an affordable solar system and brings renewable energy to powerless communities. With a goal to break the structural uh, barriers to poverty reduction, Sunbox has provided electricity to hundreds of people, reduced CO2 emissions by replacing non-environmental energy solutions such as generators and candles, and created jobs to this area that has been reported by the World Bank to have the highest unemployment rate. Majd has earned multiple awards for her work, including MIT's Pan Arab Competition, being selected as one of the most creative people in business by Fast Company in 2018, and she was also awarded the Muhammad Ali Humanitarian Award. Uh, Majd, Take it over. Thank you so much, Rania. Hi, everyone. Tamir, sorry, apologies. Tamir, can you stop stop your sharing? Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, yes, please. Okay. Thank you, Tamir. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Rania, for the great introduction. I'm so glad to be with you today. My name is Majd. Um, I'm a Palestinian. I was born in Gaza. I grew up there. And uh, today I'm going to present uh, the second, my second company, Sunbox. Sunbox started as a small uh, social enterprise in Gaza and we, we grew up and now we function in two main markets, in Gaza and in Saudi Arabia. We'll give you a brief in less than like seven minutes about the company, what we do, what is our current steps and next steps. And then I will give you more details about who am I, where I came from. Uh, Sunbox, as I mentioned, we started in Gaza, but now we are a multinational corporation uh, that operates uh, across the Middle East. So we work now, we have our headquarters in the UK and we work in Saudi Arabia and Palestine. We employ around 15 engineers uh, full time and a couple of other technicians as part time. And we have, we've installed around like over one megawatt installations only in Palestine. Um, we started this company with the mission of delivering low-cost, affordable solar solutions uh, to underprivileged communities, and then we grew up to also provide solar systems for the for the privileged communities uh, in Saudi. Our vision is not just only to provide solar energy, but also to to prove that Palestinians can build companies, we can create jobs, and we can we can as as women as we um, like me as a woman can can do other things, just being a housewife. You can do so many other things that the world proved that we cannot do it. Um, as Rania mentioned, we've won a couple of awards since we started. Uh, the first one was the Emirates Energy Award from the Prince of Dubai. In 2017, 2018, we had the MIT Award. We were the first Gazan company that won this award in, the, in like 11 years. And uh, 2019, we had the Muhammad Ali Award. Uh, we've, we, we didn't only work on the solar installations. We started with the small off-grid solar systems and we scaled up also. We opened 
um, a full ch chapter in Palestine for solar maintenance. We've also worked in the water sector, providing solar, uh, providing desalination plants with solar systems. We've also, we've, we've, we are implementing a couple of solar research and we provide solar consultancy for free and solar training for university students as well for free. Um, where we started from, in 2017, I was in the US and in a fellowship. And um, that time I was just, you know, was very confused. Uh, it was my first time to travel alone, to be alone in a country where you have 24 seven of electricity. And for me in Gaza, I used to worry every morning about whether I, if I charged my laptop or not, or what's going on, or like if I will have enough electricity to, to take a hot shower in the morning. Um, this, when I moved to the US and I saw a lot of street lights, a lot of electricity, and just, it's, it's something for granted that people have there. And this is when the idea really started. And, and we decided to start our operations in Gaza because it's, it's a market that's calling for help. In Gaza, we have around three to eight hours of electricity per day maximum. It depends on the political situation. It depends on the borders. It depends on so many things. People don't control their source of energy in Gaza. We have 2.1 million people are living under this crisis since 2006. And it's, it's growing, like people are suffering every day. And it, it, like electricity is everything. It's, 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 like, uh, it's like the spine of the, of the, of the body. Um, so, so many pe people lost their lives because they used candles that burned the whole house. And I witnessed this by my eyes. Like I've seen a house close to my house burning and three kids were, were, were like, they just died because of this crisis. So people always uh, are the ones who pay the price. And because politics failed us, we decided to bring the solution ourselves. Uh, the first thing we've done is the market analysis. We found out that around 15% uh, in Gaza, uh, there are 15% of the facilities in Gaza are powered by solar energy. And there's a huge market for 85%. Um, and we've also made a, like a quick study about the average income of the family so we can decide which solar system to bring. We have not invented any technology. We just engineered and adapted the current technology worldwide and we brought it all the way to Gaza. How do, how do we function? So in Gaza, we, we function as a social enterprise. Uh, we raise donations and at the same time, we raise investments. For the investments, we use it for high capacity solar systems. So we install high capacity solar systems um, and we take a profit. And we also apply for tenders through international organizations and uh, we take it and we generate profits out of it. At the same time, we invest, reinvest this profit by providing subsidies for the families who cannot afford paying the full amount. And we've done a couple of crowdfunding subsidizing up to 100% for the families. We've run a couple of programs, not only in the solar sector, but also in the health sector, providing um, uh, solar systems for, for medical uh, causes to run their nebulizers, electrical matrices. So in Gaza, we reinvest the profits that we generate through our solar installations for subsidizing for households. Uh, what kind of packages we provide there? We, we start we, we've started providing uh, packages from one kilowatt up to like 100 kilowatts. Uh, it depends on the family needs and also how much we can subsidize for each family. Um, these are some photos of our work in the water sector. This in the household, this in the infrastructure. And this is one of our most recognized projects that we worked on last year, providing dark villages where women get harassed during the night and kids don't go to school during winter times because it's dark. So we provided solar systems and street lights for, for these villages. We've also worked in, in the educational sector, providing schools and educational centers with solar systems. As a company, when we started it, we just had the passion of helping people and we did not know we will be recognized all over the world. So we've been, we've been recognized in the Independent, PBC, CNN, The Guardian, recently the NBC, Reuters, and I've, I've given a TED talk to over, over TED women in California in 2018. Um, we really take care of the quality. So we don't just provide systems uh, that's gonna live for one year, two years. We take care of uh, what kind of products we provide for how long it's gonna live. And also, once if, if one of the products like batteries would expire after two years, we replace it for the people and we share the price of it. So we pay up to 50% and the customer would replace the battery uh, with 50% or less. Um, of course, we have to measure our impact. So, so far we've, we've impacted 10,000 people 
uh, through providing them with clean water in, in across Gaza Strip from the north to the south, from the east to the west. We've also provided around 35,000 people in Gaza with solar energy in less than three years. And we've created job for over 65 people. Each person worked with us at least for three months. Uh, we've started our real operations in December 2017, and now we are uh, we've we've scaled up last year in in September to Saudi Arabia. Now we are now trying to start up, to kick off our pilot here. Why we why did we decide to go to Saudi before jumping to Saudi? Um, after three years of operations in Gaza, we felt it's the time to scale up because our vision is not just only to provide the Gazan community with solar energy, but also uh, to be a regional company working across the Middle East. We wanted to build a Palestinian entity, uh, an entity that's coming from Palestine and prove to the world that we are not just depending on everything to, to live, but also we can create successful businesses. So in 2020, in, in 2020 we moved to, we scaled up to Saudi and we decided to go there because uh, to go along with the vision of 2030, uh, which is uh, the vision of His Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman, uh, that says by 2030, 30% of the energy consumption in the kingdom is going to be through renewable energies. We've done a quick market research and we figured out that most of the companies here, here work on the large solar installation, while our expertise lies in the medium and small solar installation. Uh, when we looked at the energy consumption, we found out that the governmental sector is consuming around $10 billion per year for their uh, electricity. And when we looked deeper into the governmental sector, uh, we found out that around third, the third of this, um, the, the third of this amount is, is consumed by mosques. Uh, so we decided to dive deeper and work through a P2G model, providing mosques in Saudi Arabia with solar energy. Uh, this is our core team, the Gazan team. Uh, you know, we have we have now multinational team, but I always I always put the photos of these people because. The success we have today came through these these amazing heroes. I know I'm I'm the only female in the company. We are trying to hire more. It's quite complicated, but we are working on it. Uh, thank you. And one last word, um, just to imagine how many complications you have in order to get things inside Gaza. Maybe Elad can elaborate more if he has some experience. But for example, if you wanted to get one solar system into Gaza, you need to issue a separate permit for each part of the system. Like you need a permit for the panels, permit for the batteries and permit for the inverters. Uh, it takes usually weeks to get things inside. We've made it. Like we've, we've, we've got inside Gaza thousands of products working through different, three different authorities, starting from Israel, Palestine, and the West, Israel, West Bank, and Gaza. Uh, and we, we, we made it happen. And we are still struggling here, even in Saudi. Like uh, we mo I, I moved here recently start this company to start um, a new chapter and, and get some of the team members here to create jobs for more Palestinians and we are still struggling because of our identity um, so yeah what I'm trying to say is um, before moving to, to a new country I thought that the conflict uh, we have between Palestine and Israel it just it, it has its borders between these two countries but when I moved here I, I found that the conflict we have it is, is located beyond this, these borders. Like as Palestinians who are trying to create something or trying to be beneficial, productive, we have a lot of the pressure, not only from, from the conflict we have in our country, but also from the conflict um, like in the Arab world. Uh, so we, we do our best. This is a photo of Gaza. I hope to see, I hope to fly one day above and see a lot of solar panels and thank you. Thank you so much, Majd. Your work is truly amazing and inspiring. And thank you uh, for providing that insight. And now uh, we have Elad Orian. Um, in addition to being a physicist, did I say it wrong? Oh. OK. <laughs> so in addition to being a physicist with broad experience in renewable energy mini grids, he's the co-founder and general manager of Kama ME, which is an Israeli-Palestinian organization that provides basic energy and clean water services to off-grid communities in, in a way that is socially economical and environmentally sustainable. The company designs, installs, and maintains renewable energy systems and household water pumping, distribution, and filtration systems to marginalize off-grid Palestinian communities in the occupied Palestinian territories. Take it away. 
Well, hello everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have two, two uh, very tough acts to follow, so I'll do my best. Um, here, can you see the slideshow? Yes. Okay. Um, why is it not working? Okay. Um, so Comet is uh, an Israeli-Palestinian uh, NGO. We're a profit. We're a company for public benefit. Um, together with uh, my partner Noam, uh, we are the co-founders, and I'm the general manager of the company now. Um, as uh, Rania said, uh, we provide communities, Palestinian communities in Area C with basic energy and water services. But in this presentation, I'll be concentrating on the energy issue. Uh, Tamer gave a very thorough uh, introduction uh, on the history. Um, I just want to add a bit more context. Uh, I assume by the name of the organization under which we're presenting today that people who have joined have some kind of understanding of the basic politics of the area. But we work in Area C. What that means is that if, if you don't know, in, in, in 95, when the Oslo agreements were signed, um, the West Bank was divided into Area A, B, and C, where C, which is under full Israeli control, is actually the majority of the West Bank, 62% of the land mass of the West Bank is still under full Israeli control. These are the bluish grayish area in the, in the map that I'm showing here. Um, so we uh, concentrate exclusively on area C. The reasoning behind it is that we are not here to replace uh, the Palestinian Authority. There are communities in area A and B that are not connected to the West, to, to the grid. Uh, but we're not there to, 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 to replace the PA. Uh, we're there to provide those services to communities that choose to stay on their land in Area C, despite the immense difficulties that they face, um, and to support them in, 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 in their struggle. Um, that's a decision we made very early on and, and one that we're still very much committed to. Area C is mostly uh, either desert or uh, uh, the edge of the desert in a very harsh climatic condition, um, harsh weather, uh, very cold in winter, very warm uh, and dry in summer, and very unique situation in which you have one what my, what one might call man-made de-development, meaning there is a clear attempt by the Israeli authorities for the last uh, several decades to get the civilian population, the civilian Palestinian population, to move out of Area C and into Area A and B. And one of the main tools by which this is done is planning, or rather lack thereof, and, and, and definitely one of the main factors where this can be seen is provision of infrastructure. And this is where we come in. So what do we do? Since 2009, we've started working in 2000. We've actually started before, but the organization exists since 2009. We've provided a energy services to about 100 communities. Uh, we've covered the whole of the south of the West Bank and the Jerusalem-Jericho corridor and are slowly making our, our way north uh, with the objective of providing universal access in Area C. Um, not too long ago, that's something that seemed in the very distant future, but uh, we believe that uh, given 
enough funding and, and, and no drastic change in the political situation, um, this will happen in, in three, four years, not more. Um, since 2013, we also do clean water services, pumping and filtration of water. Um, we do a bit of capacity building in the communities. And what's probably the most important factor is that we do long-term stewardship of the infrastructure. And in this respect, we're a very unique organization. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, what is it that we provide? So we provide two and a half kilowatt hours per day per family. Uh, there are people from various places in this uh, webinar. So I'll, I, I don't know the numbers for other places in Israel. The average uh, consumption per household is around 18 kilowatt hours per day uh, per household. So that's significantly less what we provide. But still in the world of rural electrification, 2.5 kilowatt hours is, 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 uh, is, not, uh, is not a small number. What can you do with that? Illumination, communication, meaning, well, illumination, obviously, uh, we have lights, um, communication, cell phone charging, uh, TVs. I had really amazing experiences several years ago in the caves of South Mount Hebron, um, watching live stream from Tahrir Square in, in, in Cairo was really unbelievable. So this sense of being part of the world is very, very important. Refrigeration, um, part of the project is subsidizing the purchase of uh, refrigerators. Uh, it turns out that it's easier for us in the long term if we subsidize refrigerators that are energy efficient and, 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 and new and reliable. Um, butter churning, Practically everyone in area in rural communities in area C, their agriculture relies on animal husbandry and butter churning is, is crucial. And laundry, making laundry, but doesn't heat. It's uh, basically a big mixer, the washing machines that they, that they use there. Um, Comet is, is really a hybrid, a very unique, I think, uh, approach to the issue of rural electrification um, as a hybrid between a grassroots political organization and a, and a small vertically integrated electric and water utility. So we provide a, really a service for these people. It's, it's, it's not, we don't provide a system and go, we provide a service. Um, and this is really the, 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 the key to, to our methodology. Every system that we ever installed is still in operation, or rather every user that we ever connected still gets uh, the service. We might have uh, changed the whole of the system, but uh, the user gets the service and they pay for it. It's not a gift. Um, they, uh, the users uh, pay and they pay roughly what, what I pay in Israel, what, what uh, uh, consumers in, in the West Bank pay. Um, most importantly, that builds a sense of ownership and it also, also rationalizes the use of energy. Um, the, the one thing that is very important to say um, especially if we look at the previous slide, is that uh, everyone benefits from the introduction of electricity. But by far, the main beneficiaries are women. And this is something we hear uh, regularly again and again. Um, it transforms the life of women. There is no question about it. It's, it's um, it's a very strong and very consistent observation that we have. Um, just a, a few visuals to get a sense. So we build everything from microgrids that provide 
uh, whole communities. So this is an uh, electricity room of a relatively large electricity system. Uh, batteries on the right, electronics on the left. There are um, um, solar arrays outside and, um, and, and, uh, and two wind turbines also. Um, this is a relatively big solar array for us. Um, this is a community just outside Jerusalem. Uh, three years ago, several months after the system was installed, the army raided the community and without prior notice or anything, confiscated all the PV, broke into the electricity room, tore the electronics off the wall. And we had uh, several very intense months of uh, both uh, legal and diplomatic struggle and everything was returned. And, and when, when we talk about stewardship of the system, it's not only technical, it's not only managerial, it's also political and legal. So every system, and there has been several cases where systems were confiscated and there have been many cases where systems are under a threat of demolition. Um, every single system that we've built is still operational. Raising a wind turbine, these are all home built, uh, DIY completely. Um, we, we didn't raise any new one for a very long time, but when we did raise it, we raised them usually at night so as to attract uh, little attention from the Israelis. This is a family system, so uh, three uh, TV panels outside, and this is the box inside. Yeah, but in terms of the users, it's pretty transparent. They get roughly the same service. Um, meeting of community representative. And uh, this is our center in, uh, in South Mount Hebron. Which is also off grid, by the way, and Tamara knows it well. Um, so that's it. I'm very slightly uh, behind time, but uh, the closing words that I'd like to share, uh, the, 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 the lessons that I think should be learned from this long term approach, this is very, very important. Uh, you shouldn't be looking at, uh, at a funding cycle. You shouldn't be looking at an installation cycle. You should be looking at, a, at an open-end approach, really. Um, how uh, can you keep the system or the service up and running? It's very important to understand the context. That's why uh, you know, we're Palestinians and Israelis. We're from here. We're not this. Uh, uh, um, image that one have of uh, development projects in, in, in Africa where you have a bunch of Europeans that come in, in big trucks, get off, write some notes and, and, and leave. Uh, we're here. Um, treat the people that you're working with as adults, and, which means you shouldn't be racist, you shouldn't be condescending, but you also shouldn't be giving them discounts and uh, humility. You need to walk the walk. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Imad. I really appreciate you taking time to go over what you and your company is doing. And again, thank you to all the panelists for all of your work and for giving us such an amazing insight and background in renewable energy in the occupied Palestine. So as we are um, out of time, we did have a little bit of discussion planned out, but we are going to go just jump into the question and answer. And um, since we are past the time, we've got about a half an hour for questions. Oh, perfect. We can, we can go till half past the hour. Okay, that's good. Um, but just in case anybody uh, may need to hop off, because this was, um, well, says an hour, don't worry, this is being recorded. So you can watch it at your convenience. So now we're going to just jump on to the question and answer portion. So the first question is for Elad. So what town exactly did this happen? This refers to what? The destruction of those panels that you said the, the, the Kogak came in and destroyed that array of panels. 
No, they, they, they were not destroyed. They were confiscated and we were able to get them back. Where did uh, this happen? Jibedim. Can you please repeat that? Jibedib, it's a tiny community in Area C. I think the chances that people here know it are very slim, but uh, that's the name of the place. And how, and how often does that happen? If you were to give on a scale. Well, once in, in a decade, that, that's the only time that something like this happened. And there were confiscations of family systems and, and we have under, and we have other uh, bigger systems that are under threat of demolition, but uh, none that was demolished. Okay. So we move on to our next question. So Maj, can you describe any problems that you may have had when connecting to the grid in Gaza? Yes. Um, so the grid in Gaza is not stable. Um, like you, you cannot rely on the grid and install on grid solar systems because you don't have um, 24 hours of electricity. And, and you have like limited hours that you never know when it's gonna be on, sometimes during the night, sometimes during the daylight. So you need a backup system by the end of the day. So what we do, we've started our operations in installing uh, on a grid, uh, sorry, off a grid solar systems. And we upgraded it to be hybrid solar systems. Hopefully in the future, if we have 24 hours, like three, four years from now, like, like uh, inshallah, let's be optimistic. We can, we can like reuse the electricity, the feature inside these inverters to send the electricity back to the grid. Um, also an, another part is, our grid in Gaza is not capable to have uh, reverse electricity, like like a huge amount of reverse electricity. Reverse electricity, like if like if, if we can say like a hundred houses installed fifty kilowatts, that's like around fifty thousand watts, uh, fifty thousand kilowatts. So that the, the grid is not capable to carry this amount of electricity and send it back. That's why we think it's uh it's uh, it's not ready yet to send the electricity back. Thank you. Thank you. And I think there was like a recent study where they mentioned that since Palestine receives about 3,000 hours of sunshine every year, which equates to about eight hours per day, um, and then due to the topography and land use criteria, the eastern and southern parts of the West Bank are most suitable for harnessing solar energy. So what would you recommend for regions outside those areas where solar energy may not be the most optimal um, option? And this can go for anyone. Okay, so shall we go or you wait for Elad to answer? It's either one of you. Just anyone can Elad, you, you, Can I go first? Can I go please first? go, please. Yeah. So um, um, regarding connecting to the grid, again, like same problem, like even though if we install on a grid solar systems and it's gonna benefit the house during the daylight, during the night, you need electricity. So, and, and sometimes it's off during the night. So it, it will be useless to install only on grid systems because no electricity would, you would have during the, the night. Um, and when we, when we wanted to install, some, some of our customers said, oh, I want the feature of sending the electricity back to the grid to be on. Um, this should be agreed from, uh, from JITCO and Gaza. Why? Because some people turned on this feature and it started giving back to the grid and the houses around it, their, their, their lamps and their electricity were, was flashing. You know what I mean? Because the electricity is reversed in a, like in a wrong way. Because as I mentioned, the grid is not capable um, in some villages and in some locations in Gaza. So yes, we, we had some issues with some customers uh, and we tried to convince them. Um, as, as far as I know, Jetco in Gaza is now um, like taking this into consideration regarding uh, having on a grid solar systems with on a grid feature on, uh, but I'm not sure if, they, if, if, if they've said, yeah, let's do this. Thank you. Eli, do you have anything to contribute or add? Um, I'm, I'm, we do exclusively off grid. We build our own grids and, and we have uh, no uh, interface with, uh, with, with any grid. So I'm really not the, not the person to, to discuss that, uh, that issue. But in those yeah, regions every, every where- system, 
every uh, all the big systems that we built are future proof in the sense that if tomorrow electricity gets to the communities where we work we could connect them technically but then it's a it's a separate issue the the carrying capacity of the grid and, and, and paying tariffs and all of that, 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 that's a separate issue. Our systems are able to do that, um, but it doesn't happen at the moment and, and not in the foreseeable future. Okay, thank you. Tom, do you have anything to add? Um, I saw some questions about wind shore turbines. I'm not sure if, if I should answer this question or just comment. Uh, we can go on to the next question if you don't. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, I don't have anything to comment on my answer yet. Okay. Um, Can you please move on to the next question? Yeah, there is another question I just have noticed on the the chat about wind, wind offshore wind turbines on 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 Gaza Sea. Actually, according to Oslo Accords, um, um, uh, wind uh, turbines in general are considered towers. So um, and there are uh, some restrictions on the, in the installation of towers in the Palestinian. Uh, um, uh, territories. So any uh, tower is higher than um, um, eight meters should be licensed directly or individually by the Israeli administration um, authorities. And as you know, that uh, eight meters uh, long uh, uh, length, sorry, for any wind turbine is not that uh, visible to uh, generate electricity. So there's a huge challenge for wind turbines. I think Elad uh, knows a lot about wind turbines and installation in Masafar Yatta because they, they, they are facing a lot of problems. Um, currently, we are conducting a study to generate electricity for this specific region, which is called Masafari Yatta, because there is a wind turbine, uh, a wind, uh, but again, we're facing a lot of challenges because uh, the minimum length of the tower should be at least 50 uh, meters, and this requires a, sp a special permit from the Israeli uh, government. Regarding the potential of wind uh, uh, in Palestine, there are some, some potential, but not like solar. Uh, potential. So the answer is yes, there is a huge challenge for wind turbines because uh, it is considered as towers and towers should be licensed by the Israeli administration authorities. And Marjani Lad, same question regarding the desalina desalination plants. Yes, um, um, th we have a major desalination plant uh, that, that was funded by Yon ONSCO, I guess, and implemented by uh, a CMW, the Coastal Water Municipality Authorities. Uh, it had some problems regarding sending the electricity back to the grid again, not because of the grid itself this time, because of the harmony of the system. Uh, I think they are still working on it, like they wanted to fix it. Um, it's functioning, uh, but not with full capacity. At the desalination plant we worked on are quite smaller, that are inside villages. Each one is producing 10 to 15,000 of, of uh, pure clean water every day. So regarding, uh, you, you mean regarding having a major desalination plant in Gaza? Yes. Yes. Um, I think there was, a, there was a project that was funded by the USAID and it had three main stages. Uh, they've implemented the first stage, the second, and during the second stage, uh, Trump administration came over and and they stopped the USA, USAID fund. Um, and hopefully they will resume working on this project. But this, this project is supposed to, to have a line from the east of Gaza to the west of Gaza, and the, sorry, from the north to the south of Gaza, feeding all Gaza Strip with the clean uh, and drinking water that will be directly injected in the water network, even like not only just for drinking, but also like for the kitchen, for everything inside the, inside the house. But it's not functioning yet, like it's not finished yet. Thank you. Anything to add, Elad? Uh, that's from a way out of my uh, my uh, of my pay grade. We do small off-grid uh, installations, but the, the obvious here, the obvious thing to say here is that uh, it's not a technical problem, it's a political problem. Uh, there is, uh, I mean, Israel has transformed over the last decade its uh, water uh, infrastructure um, through desalination. And the, the knowledge, the know-how, the technology, the possibility, everything is here. It's, it's definitely only a question 
of, uh, of political will to do it. And what are your thoughts, I guess, on the expansion of other renewables? So I know we talked about solar and we talked and you talked about wind, but how about geothermal? What is the effectiveness of having um, geothermal as an energy solution? And someone also, also asked about tidal, so geothermal mm -hmm. and tidal energy. I don't think that the, 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 the resources are here. Ormat is one of the leading companies in the world in uh, geothermal, and uh, I don't think that they have any major installation in, in, in Israel or Palestine. I just don't think that the conditions are here. And I'm not an expert, but I'm not aware of any major tidal energy project um, anywhere in the world. I think this is uh, future technology. I don't think, and, 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 and I don't think that there is too much tidal energy in the Mediterranean as is. Um, I, I think uh, the, 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 just one more sentence. Yeah, sure. The, the, the problem is not with the technology. If there is political will with uh, renewables, with better grids, with, uh, of course, first and foremost, with a uh, uh, equitable use of the resources that already exist, uh, we can uh, step forward a very large chunk of, of, of the way. Uh, it's not, it's not a, 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 that there is no technology, it's not going to Mars. It's uh, something that uh, can be done here and now. And just to um, make a Quick comment. Tidal energy is not necessarily super new because I know it's been existing like in the US and Maine and Alaska. And I think South Korea has the biggest um, facility for tidal power. So it is a thing, but I just, I think like where Palestine is, I don't think tidal power is, is feasible there. Maj, go ahead. Uh, yeah, regarding the thermal, I will echo what Elad just said. Uh, regarding if politics is uh, is allowing us to do so many things. So, you know, technology won't be the barrier. And we have a professor at the Islamic University in Gaza who, had, who, who, who has done uh, a pilot for thermal energy. And in order to dig inside, he had to issue a permit from the Israeli army because of the, you know, the tunnels and this, and also permit from the Gazan government. So it just like, see, just to do a pilot. So what if you wanted to do a bigger project in, in this field? Like we, we honestly, as, as Alad also mentioned, and Dr. Tamer, we work like, you know, just we try to fit everything around all of these regulations and uh, obstacles and conditions. With these, with these obstacle condition, I, from a technical and a political standpoint, do you think it would be more effective to really have a greater focus on dependency on renewables as opposed to having it more evenly distributed between non-renewables non and renewables? Do you think you get a little bit more political freedom if we were trying to push more for renewables? Um, well, for us, like things has never been easy, easy mm -hmm. and it's not getting easier. Like the permits that we issue now for our products is the same permits we issued three years ago, okay? So some people find it easier to have a small generator or to have like a, like a, you know, a street generator and they take, they take electricity from it. Because if you want to install a solar system, it's expensive and you need to replace the batteries. So it's, in, in a way it's sustainable and in another way it's, uh, it's not. Um, so no, um, like my life is getting complicated on the personal level. So on the profession level is, is also, it's, it's, uh, it's not getting easy. Let's move on to the next question. Someone, is, well, someone was asking about water provision, uh, the importance of, or the use of alternative energy or renewable energy to drive uh, pumping of water in, in places where there isn't a lot of it. Thoughts on that? David, um, so in, in, in the West Bank, um, definitely in, in South Mount Hebron, where we started working, uh, groundwater is uh, around 800 meters deep. 
So uh, drilling for water is a major project that is definitely not done um, on a family basis. It's, uh, it's a major operation. Even in the Jordan Valley, the, the groundwater is getting lower and lower. And uh, I think it's 90, 100 meters deep. Um, so uh, that's a real issue. And uh, I think, again, one must remember, uh, Palestine is a very small place, very, very small place. It makes much more sense to put pipes from existing points than uh, drill new uh, wells, especially that they're so deep. Um, it's, it's always, it's a political issue. It's not a technical issue. I, I, I'm not sure did that answer the question. I'm, I'm not sure, but can uh, continue the discussion. I saw that someone also asked about an atmospheric water generator, whether or not that would work. Um, my thoughts is are in the region of Palestine, just it's climate conditions. Um, they don't have a lot, there's not a large amount of water, um, but that's just my take on it. Um, anybody have, does anyone else have anything to add regarding um, a project for an atmospheric water generator? I don't know. I think the, the numbers I've seen on, uh, on atmospheric water generators are, you know, bare survival for, for a family. Um, a family with uh, 100 uh, heads of, uh, of, of uh, sheep or, or goats uh, needs a, in the summer uh, 1,500 liters per day. That's, uh, as far as I know, that's uh, way, way, way above uh, the capabilities of anything remotely economical for uh, an atmospheric water generator. Things we need to like understand and really think about when we're looking into different renewable energy technologies is you have to understand the whole landscape because as we know, for a solution to truly be sustainable, the technology alone isn't, isn't what's gonna make a quality impact, it's how it's being applied. So you have to look at the region's climate conditions or topology, the, the political atmosphere that's in, and the economics. So it's all these different factors that go in. So all, although there are a lot of amazing renewable energy and different types of energy sources, not all of those will be applicable to the region itself based on so many different factors. So that's why I think an atmospheric water generator wouldn't be feasible. Can you talk briefly about one or several of you about the disparities between the provision of energy to uh, isolated you know, rural Palestinian communities in Area C versus provision of energy and water to, to settlements like, you know, 30 or 40 paces away? We're half a kilometer away, the settlement gets the water and the energy, the Palestinian, the Bedouin community doesn't. Can you talk briefly about that? Yes, um, uh, if I may comment on that, uh, uh, there is uh, like a total uh, different uh, situation between settlements and uh, villages. Uh, uh, and the can you come closer to the microphone, Tom, there? Yeah. It's very hard yes. to hear you. Um, now, can you hear me better now? Much better. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, there is a total different situation between the settlements and uh, the villages around the settlements because um, um, settlements are considered kind of uh, like uh, very well served uh, communities by, by lines, by there's no, no limitation on electricity to provide these settlements because most of the settlements in, in the West Bank are either agriculture based communities or industrial. Uh, uh, based communities. So, um, for example, there are some huge settlements, industrial huge settlements in the West Bank, like uh, Burkan uh, settlement, uh, Mali Adumim uh, settlement. These um, um, these settlements are uh, are huge industrial zones actually, where a lot of electricity are provided to these settlements. 
in the, on the other hand uh, um, we are struggling in, in providing some few megawatts more to some villages so as to uh, establish some in, some small uh, factories just very very small factories so um, um, the Israeli government know how to play this role uh, 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 very well because they know more electricity means more industry so instead of having um, kind of 60,000 laborers Palestinian laborers who are working in Mali Adumim or in Purkan in, in the West Bank uh, these laborers will be working in the Palestinian zone so for sure most of the villages are suffering from uh, what we call it the current cap where uh, they control the amount of electricity they just want to provide electricity for domestic living that's it like like uh, residential use that's it any other use uh, should be uh, uh, licensed that should be justified and uh, a lot of obstacles are put uh, on the table in order just to maintain the superiority of the israeli industry uh, uh, sector including the agriculture, agriculture, I saw some questions about the water bombing system. Um, two years ago, we have uh, started uh, a project, funded project um, by the Austrian government in the Jordan Valley so as to pump uh, uh, water by photovoltaic uh, systems to the farmers over there because they are buying the, the water at a very high level because it's not just uh, um, um, getting the water out of, outside of, from the land, it's also distribute the water all over the land is, is also important. We, we, Palestine is a mountainous uh, country, and uh, uh, what we call technically the total dynamic head of, of the uh, these systems is really high. So we need to pump the water uh, horizontally to the to the yards and the fields, so as to deliver uh, uh, the water. So currently, the, the farmers at the at Jordan Valley they buy the one uh, cube meter of, of water at one dollar, which is very very high for them. Um, 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 and we start, we have started the project as a pilot project, but we faced a lot of uh, uh, restrictions from the Israeli uh, uh, army. Uh, and uh, yeah, the project stopped because uh, uh, the, uh, the Austrian government, they have uh, stopped the project because we could not continue because a lot of obstacles uh, occurred uh, with the Israeli government. Uh, it, it, Jordan Valley is kind of uh, a very sensitive uh, area and uh, a lot of Israeli farmers are doing uh, a lot of uh, agricultural activities. So again, uh, uh, Israeli, the Israeli government would like just to keep the superiority of these farmers as compared to the Palestinian farmers because when, when the Palestinian farmers could not plant their lands, they will go directly to the Israeli farmers and work under their supervision. And this is what the Israeli government would like to have. Even by the way, uh, um, um, recently, now this, this season is the strippery uh, season in Palestine. So in Gaza, they, they, they plant a lot of stripperies. Uh, uh, and, and usually the Palestinians in the West Bank, they prefer the, 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 the strippery coming from Gaza. Uh, so the settlements now, they are getting the same sticker at, like made in Gaza and they put it on the strippery product so as to be in the West Bank as Palestinian yeah. products, despite this is not a Palestinian product, it's a product by the settlements. But they just know that, that we start to now, well, we prefer the Gaza strippery. So this is Gaza strippery, despite that this is not Gaza strippery. We know this from the taste. So uh, it's, uh, it's a struggle since ever, since uh, uh, the, the starting of the conflict by making more living for the people because the Israeli government that knows that, well, the people may be believe uh, in an idea, but the most important to, to have an opportunity so as to believe in the idea. It's, it's, it's very obvious that without jobs, without uh, um, uh, conditions, without uh, privileges, no one will believe in anything. So, Dr. Tan, I will uh, echo what you've said just about jobs. Yes. Um, like, look at us now at Sunbox. Like, we try to scale up the company and create more jobs because Gaza and the West Bank is a small market. And we've said, let's stand on our feet. We've, we've raised a lot of investment from recognized U.S. investors. And we started our operations in Gaza and the amount of complications we had with no support from any government was crazy and was enough to stop us. Yeah. And then when we became successful after three years, We've lost a lot of money in the beginning, and then we proved the concept. And now we scaled up to another country, which is an Arab country and basically supposed to support us, right? Like this is the first thing you can think of when you scale up to an Arab country. And then you come to this country and you have more complications just because you are Palestinian. Like I had different shapes of racist sentences against me while dealing with people here, saying you Palestinians sold your land while you are here, why you are coming here. I'm not here to play, I'm not here to invest, I'm here to hire people, I'm here to get employment. But see how much like 
So that's what I'm trying to say. Like you, you are talking about the strawberry, which is out of Gaza borders, right? So what we think of, what, how can, can we think of what happens out of Palestine borders, right? How we are treated as Palestinians. We are not limited by the conflict we have inside. You have conflict literally everywhere we go because of our identity. So that's what I'm trying to explain to the world. Like our message should not be just about, oh, we wanted freedom and we want to end the occupation. We have to do this. Plus, we have an identity. We should have something, you know, to rely on. We should have the enough support. But here, I'm here with no support. You know, a lot of fake promises. Yeah, even the, um, uh, that's very true. Even, uh, by the way, one of the obstacles, uh, I could not really explain things uh, in a long way when I presented my presentation. The problem that uh, the Israeli government has established what we call the Palestinian government, which is totally depending on the taxes coming from the Israeli government. And... Uh, uh, for the Palestinian uh, government, the most important is to get money from the uh, taxes, uh, which is mainly uh, based on the exports uh, and like uh, even the imports actually from outside uh, Israel. So um, 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 the Palestinian uh, 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 government is, is, uh, is not even without even power to, to, to invest in, in industry and in, in research and in, in everything because it's just getting money from Israel and paying the employees uh, uh, inside Palestine. So it is very uh, surprising, by the way, that most of the Palestinians who are hired by the Palestinian government are 70% of the total uh, employment power of the Palestinians. Meanwhile, most of the Palestinians are either working in a private, uh, in, in a private jobs, private jobs, or, or working in uh, uh, the Israeli uh, 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 industrial sector. Kind of uh, four years ago, Oh, even more, like five years ago, the Israeli, there were some Israeli um, 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 uh, campaign just to boycott the Palestinian labors and getting some Thai labors or some, some foreign labors, uh, labors outside from uh, Palestine. But this could not work. There, <laughs> believe it or not, there is a chemistry between the Palestinian labors and the Palestinian, uh, uh, oh, sorry, the Israeli employers. And uh, they like the way they work because the Palestinian, many of them, actually most of the Palestinian labors, they they speak Hebrew, uh, they can communicate with them, they trust them. So um, I, I said it many times, um, um, Israel uh, um, uh, is, at first is interested in, in the Palestinian human resources and would like to keep this occupation as a free of charge occupation without paying any money. And this what Oslo Accords gave them, that they got, they, they, they maintained the occupation of the West Bank without paying any penny while the European Union or all of the uh, donors are paying on behalf of uh, this occupation. Um, so we're actually going to get to our last question um, before. So I'm just going to ask there any. This is our last question that we're going to ask about, which I think we hinted at a little bit earlier. Um, but while, as we've noticed, electricity is very important, but a lot obviously Palestinians uh, do require hot water. So how much access is there um, to modern solar collectors? Um, 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 in, in fact, there are a lot of uh, um, solar water heaters in Palestine um, because um, uh, it's other than uh, Arab world, we do have uh, solar water heaters. Most of the Palestinian houses in the West Bank, I mean, they do have solar water heaters on the top because when uh, uh, the Israelis came from Europe, they bring this technology or this culture, let's, let's say, with them. And now uh, the Palestinians start doing like them. So. Uh, uh, we do have solar water heaters on the top and uh, we utilize this technology in a very well way. I have to say that at home level or at a small scale, there's no restrictions to use uh, solar water heaters, either uh, the, the plates or the evacuated tubes, um, because um, it has nothing to do with energy. Um, 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 we, don't, we don't rely on electricity uh, to heat water. So that's why the Israeli government is not really that interested in such a technology. Like it does not uh, harm their interests in, 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 in Palestine. So, um, yeah, in, in both in, in winter and summer, we do have solar water heaters on most of, uh, of the houses in the West Bank, and we use it very well. I said, as again, uh, this uh, uh, technology is not restricted. Uh, on, on the other hand, the, the, the generating uh, electricity uh, technologies are very restricted uh, because uh, the Palestinian uh, customers uh, to the Israeli electricity company are 2.5 million customers. We pay them a lot of money to get a very low quality electricity at the highest, at one of the highest rates in the world. By the way, we pay for the kilowatt hour uh, about 14 cents. 
Africa, which is one of the highest uh, rates in, in the world. It's even sometimes higher than Europe, by the way. And uh, uh, with a very, very low quali quality about the service, or what you mean, the reliability, I mean, um, um, we do have a lot of shortages. And the, about the, the, the amcity, which means the amount that you get uh, for I think you're cutting out, Tamer. Yeah, um, so I think we're just gonna jump off to close remarks um, from David. Um, so David, um, you can. Yes, yeah, so, well, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for joining us. A huge thanks uh, particularly to Tamer, uh, Elad and, and Majd for being our panelists today and sharing this, uh, um, this incredibly important information with us, which is uh, at, at once uh, highly technical, but also highly personal and, and very close to the ground. Uh, th those of you who wish to uh, uh, watch the video, the complete video of this Zoom webinar, uh, you, you just need to go to our, our website, uh, scientistsforpalestine.com. You can see the website here. Uh, we will be posting the full video presentation, as, as well as the, the individual power, PowerPoints. And uh, from there, you'll be able to contact uh, uh, Tamer, Majd, and Elad for, for further information. So um, without further ado, I'd like to thank you all for joining us uh, t today for this, this Zoom session. And uh, by all means, please, uh, uh, please stay tuned to, to Scientists for Palestine and, and join us if you're a scientist uh, and, and get involved in, in our work. So uh, thank you very much. Does anybody have any final words to say, uh, Rania or Rami or Andy? Yes, thank you Tibbin for showing up. Thank you for your questions and thank you for Scientists for Pale Science for um, sharing this issue and really bringing representation to this very important topic.